And uh, as people are coming in, if I just turn off the music for a moment and welcome you to the Automatic Benefit for Children Coalition's webinar, Ensuring Families Receive the Child Tax Credit, Innovative Outreach Strategies and Removing Barriers for Families to Sign Up. We are gonna start with just a quick little message from Tracy Morgan. People often look at me and think I'm a fireman because of my bravery and my knowledge of the color red. So when they came to me and said, Chief, tell them about the American Rescue Plan. I jumped down a fire pole and I got to work. Boom, boom, boom. Ma'am, do you have any kids at home? Oh, yes, I do, handsome fireman. Let's keep this professional. But what if I could put out some of your financial fires? Up to $300 per month per child. It could rescue you. Who took? All right, so with that from Tracy Morgan, uh, welcome everyone. That's really what it's all about today, um, trying to ensure that everyone who is eligible for the child tax credit gets the support they deserve and they need. Tracy Morgan knows how important it is to ensure every family who is eligible receives the child tax credit this year. And today we'll be diving into how we can unleash our each of our inner firefighter to help knock on doors and do whatever is necessary uh, to reach families. My name is Elisa Minoff. I'm with the Center for the Study of Social Policy. And along with the Children's Defense Fund, we co-chair the ABC Coalition. Our mission as a coalition is to create a child allowance or a guaranteed minimum income for children that provides regular, meaningful assistance to families, promotes racial equity and justice, enjoys broad public support, and serves as a foundation for an equitable and inclusive social support system. I want to take a moment to briefly introduce other members of the ABC team who, who you will hear more from during this webinar. I'll turn it over to Alex. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you. My name is Alex Kocha, and I'm a senior policy analyst at Center for Study of Social Policy with Elisa. Turn it to Emma. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emma Meirabi. I'm the Director of Poverty Policy at the Children's Defense Fund. I'll kick it over to Zach. Hi, I'm Zach Tilly. I am a Policy Associate at the Children's Defense Fund, um, working with Emma. Thank you. And I want to thank each of them for all of their work pulling this event together. It could not have happened. It was a very much a team effort of all of us working together on this. So to start, the one-year expansion of the child tax credit made possible by the American Rescue Plan, plan is hugely important. And it's already providing so many families that regular support they need to help with the cost of raising kids. On July 15th, families, which included almost 60 million children, began automatically receiving up to $300 per month for each child under six, and up to $250 each month for each child ages six to 17. These families will, will, will receive monthly checks from now through December, and hopefully longer if the CTC expansion is made permanent. And they'll be able to use the support in ways that make the most sense for themselves, whether it's paying the bills, saving for a rainy day or for college, covering the costs of extra, extracurricular activities and recreational activities, and much more. But as we all know, there are millions of children who are likely eligible for the CTC, but have not received it automatically. And while estimates of exactly how many children are eligible but not receiving it vary significantly, we know many are likely living in families with the lowest incomes, families who are not required to file taxes and therefore are not in the IRS's system. The task ahead is to make sure these children and families receive the support that they are owed and that they need. During this webinar, we will hear from our panelists who work directly with families and communities and hear from them about the innovative outreach strategies that they're employing to reach families who need the monthly support from the CTC the most. For those of you in the audience who are working on the ground in communities, the webinar is designed to provide you some basic tools and introduce you to some resources to help families access the CTC and navigate the process of signing up while also sharing some of the best practices in reaching families who are most likely to be left out 
including immigrant families, uh, families who are unhoused and others. For those of you who are engaged in policy at the national level, we will also be discussing how to improve policy moving forward to dismantle barriers to access and improve outreach so that the system as a whole works better for all families and advances racial and economic justice. Just a couple of housekeeping points before we begin. This meeting is being recorded uh, and we will share the recording as well as any of the resources that are shared over the course of this webinar with you afterwards in an email. And we have a large number of people on this call, we're at 160 right now. Um, so please stay on mute unless you are posing a comment or a question uh, to one of the panelists. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alex to introduce our panelists and walk through our plans for today. Thanks so much, Elisa. It's great to be with you today and to introduce our four panelists. First, we have Darla Bardine. Darla has dedicated her career to young people and families who experience homelessness, poverty, violence, and exploitation. As executive director of the National Network for Youth, her work leverages her skills as a leader and public interest attorney to create an organization that truly reflects its values of respect, equity, collaboration, solutions, and change. Ms. Bardine holds a bachelor's in criminal justice from Penn State University, a master's in nonprofit management from the University of Roehampton, and a law degree from Georgetown University. Second, we have Pablo Blanc. Pablo is CASA's Director of Immigrant in Integration and leads the tax program. CASA runs four volunteer income tax assistance sites, preparing over 2,000 tax returns every year in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. CASA partners with the IRS and local coalitions on raising CTC and EITC awareness. And this year, CASA led the victory to pass the Maryland Earned Income Tax Credit for ITIN filers. Recently, Pablo has been involved in supporting CASA members suing the Trump administration for not issuing stimulus checks to minors who are U.S. citizens due to the immigration status of their parents. Additionally, Pablo runs the citizenship program which has helped over 6,000 lawful permanent residents become U.S. citizens in the last eight years. Third, we have Kat Lily Blair. Kat is a Colorado native with over 12 years experience in business management and development and a degree in business administration. Kat has had close ties to Family Promise of Colorado Springs since 2013 when she and her children experienced homelessness and were guests of the family shelter. Once stably housed, she and her children volunteered with various congregations to provide meals and overnight hosting. In November of 2014, Kat joined the Family Promise Finance Committee and then the staff in March of 2015. Since that time, she's learned that she has a passion for working to improve supports for families experiencing housing instability and loves having the privilege of walking alongside families in her community. Kat currently serves on the Family Promise National Board of Trustees and on the Pikes Peak Continuum of Care Board of Directors. And finally, we have Courtney O'Reilly. For the last decade, Courtney has worked to increase access to beneficial tax credits among marginalized communities. She is currently contracting with Code for America as their Navigator Program Manager to support trusted community-based organizations in helping households understand and complete the process of filing their taxes and navigate additional challenges related to accessing critical tax benefits. Prior to starting at Code for America, Courtney was the Director of Tax Help Colorado at the Pitton Foundation, where she oversaw the strategy, execution, and evaluation of Tax Help Colorado, a volunteer income tax assistance program that utilizes community partners, volunteers, and students to provide free and trustworthy tax filing assistance across Colorado. I know you'll join me in silently welcoming our panelists. Uh, as we get going, we'd love for you all to introduce yourselves as well. So please tell us in the chat where you're calling in from and also what you hope to learn from this webinar. In terms of what to expect today, Courtney will first walk us through the non-filer signup tool and what it means to be a child tax credit navigator. We'll then have a moderated conversation with our other three panelists on removing barriers and innovative outreach strategies, and then open up to all four panelists for Q&A. As Elisa said throughout the call, as you have questions, either hold on to them until our Q&A session 
or drop them in the chat and we'll make sure that they're addressed. And with that, Courtney, the screen is yours. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Alex. Let me get my share. All right, perfect. Well, hi, everyone. As Alex said, my name is Courtney O'Reilly. I'm the Navigator Program Manager at Code for America. And today I want to discuss uh, the Get CTC Navigator role. I'm sure many of you on the webinar are interested in how to help uh, your community access and understand the advanced child tax credit payments. And we think the best way to do that is through Navigator utilization. A few of our learning outcomes for this training, uh, we want to briefly review the Navigator role and introduce some best practices. We'll spend some time specifically discussing what I think is the primary function of the Navigator, which is to determine the client's appropriate next steps. And then finally, we'll learn how to help someone complete the IRS non-filer sign-up tool. First, just a little background on us. So Code for America is a nonprofit organization that partners with government to strengthen the delivery of public service through human-centered technology. A few years ago, we became interested in the earned income tax credit because of its uh, because of the big it is the biggest public benefit for workers. It provides flexible cash that allows people to address their own most painful problems. We see there is a dignity in cash that feels different to clients than other forms of support. After listening to households struggling to claim these tax credits and groups already in this field, we partnered with IRS's uh, VITA program to uh, create a service that is free trustworthy, simple, and available anytime, anywhere. But the challenge to reach everyone remains, and this is where navigators come in. We know outreach alone is not enough to overcome the challenges households face in obtaining these resources, but trusted navigators with the access to the right resources and information can make a huge difference. But what is a navigator? Well, <laughs> navigators are trusted community-based guides that help marginalized non-filers utilize IRS tools, understand and complete the process of filing their taxes, and navigate additional challenges related to accessing critical tax benefits, including but not limited to, limited to the advanced child tax credit, earned income tax credit, stimulus payments, and state tax credits. So what types of assistance can navigators provide? And this is just a brief overview. You can interpret this in different ways um, based on what you think your community needs most. So the first is outreach and trust building. Awareness and trust are key hurdles for my marginalized clients, and many clients are particularly fearful of the IRS. Navigators can bring comfort and validation to the process, especially if they are directly or indirectly associated with trusted community institutions or partners. Answering basic questions about tax benefits. Taxes can feel overwhelming and navigators can help by answering basic questions and providing clarity around a variety of topics. Determining which tax benefits a client may be eligible for. So many non-filers are unaware that they are eligible for benefits accessible through the tax code, especially marginalized non-filers, such as mixed immigration status household and people who are incarcerated. Some, uh, most low-income families will not need to take any action to access the advanced child tax credit. Navigators can assess if clients need to take actions or provide reassurance that the IRS is everything they need to issue the expected refund. This will help free up resources to serve those who do not need to take action and limit client confusion. And with assisting the client in completing their action steps, this could include uh, using the non-filer sign-up tool, which we'll get into later, Connecting them with free services to file a full tax return and claim all eligible benefit might be acquiring some missing tax documents or identification documents and connecting them with additional services. So just a few best practices, uh, build, building trust around the tools needed to successfully file and access benefits, clients may be concerned about how their personal information will be used and cautious about incorrectly claiming credits. Hearing your assurance and encouragement can mean all the difference to them claiming these valuable tax credits. Tax credits and the tools used to access them can be complicated. You should familiarize yourself with available resources in order to understand the questions you can answer with confidence and then ask help at getyourrefund.org or reach out to your local VITA site as needed for the things you can't. I think this is a really critical piece of understanding the navigator role is understanding when you can answer questions and when that might just be a little bit more complicated. 
Then prioritize helping clients access needed documents. Many marginalized non-filers have not yet been able to file because they do not have access to all their required documents and will not be able to move forward without your assistance. Help explain the process of acquiring those documents, any associated costs with doing so, and the benefits of doing so. Ensure your assistance is accessible to your intended audience. For example, providing assistance with language translation and interpretations to reach immigrant communities and meet your audience where they gather rather than expecting them to come to you. Provide access to and assistance with technology. Some clients may just need access to technology and others will need more hands-on support in navigating it. Be thoughtful about your clients' needs and how to best set them up for success. Get them to know the tools yourself so you can effectively navigate them when assisting taxpayers. And making sure to ask clients straightforward questions to understand what steps they need to take to receive their benefits. Avoid client confusion and frustration by communicating these steps clearly and succinctly. Provide additional information only when asked to do so. You'll notice very few of these best practices include anything about taxes. I want to emphasize that being a part of this work does not require a background in taxes. Most of the assistance needed is about overcoming obstacles, whether those obstacles are fear or mistrust in their system, confusion about who qualifies, and lack of access to technology and technology assistance. So please, I think there's just this idea out there that you have to be a tax expert to be in this field, and that's just simply not the case. So the first thing navigators will need to do when visiting with a client is to determine uh, what their next steps will be. And to start, we anticipate most clients may not need to do anything in order to receive these advanced child tax credit payments. If a client already filed a 2019 tax return, 2020 tax return, or a non-filer return to register for the stimulus payments or economic impact payments, and they had no significant changes since they last filed, and they will file a 2021 tax return with similar household income information, they do not need to take any further action. They may just need help answering their questions. Other steps could include the IRS CTC update portal, help using the IRS non-filer signup tool, and or get your refund.org, getting full service and other free tax filing assistance. Before we dive into the non-filer tool, I just want to quickly review um, the, idea, uh, the purpose of these other resources and who may benefit in using them. So for first, the CTC update portal. The CTC update portal will serve for a few purposes. At launch, it will allow clients to check enrollment status, view payment history, opt out of advanced payments, update or add bank account information. The IRS is also expected to update the portal later this summer to include updated dependent information and add address or update address information, which is currently not available. This may be the best tool to use if they have not filed a 2019, 2020, or non-filer form to claim their stimulus payments. And just some challenges to be aware of, if a client doesn't already have an existing IRS username, they will need to create an ID.me account to verify their identity. From personal experience and testing it on my families, this can be a really challenging for clients, even with assistance. So just be aware that some clients may have already tried to use the portal and have gotten so frustrated by not being able to just get into it to begin with. Another thing to be aware of is the landing page for the CTC update portal is available in other languages, but the portal itself is only currently available in English. Uh, learn why a taxpayer would want to opt out of the advanced child tax credit payments by reading the opt-out handout, which is available on our Navigator training resources. Then to, by helping your clients use getyourrefund.org, you will connect them to free and trustworthy assistance to file a completed tax return in order to claim all eligible benefits. This is the ideal option if they haven't filed a tax return between 2018 and 2020, and they made some earned income during the year. They may still not be required to file a return, but they may be eligible to receive additional uh, money and different tax credits. Other reason they may need to be referred to this option if they do actually have a filing requirement and should file a completed return to stay tax compliant and claim all eligible benefits. Tax certified volunteers are available to help them through a do-it-yourself option or using the full service model where somebody else is actually filing the return for them. 
And just so you're aware, you can help access the Get Your Refund website by partnering with Get Your Refund and becoming a Get Your Refund Advanced Navigators, which is a whole other ballgame and requires additional certification. But if you're interested, we're always looking for new partnerships and volunteers. And finally, we arrived to the IRS's non-filer sign-up tool. Just a brief kind of summary on that. So the non-filer tool will allow clients to file a simple, simple return in order to claim the advanced trial tax credit and the economic impact payments or stimulus checks. You should help clients use this when they haven't already filed a 2019, 2020, or non-filer return, uh, if they qualify for the child tax credit, or if they have not yet received their full economic impact impact payments amount. Um, and also, of course, they do not have a filing requirement. Some challenges uh, with this tool. This is not a mobile friendly tool, which makes it very difficult for filers that only have access to a mobile device, which is why access to technology can make a tremendous difference for this tool. And like the CTC update portal, this tool is currently only available in English. The landing page may be in Spanish and other languages, but the tool itself is only available in English. All right, so if getting into the weeds a bit, so we're gonna go kind of slide by slide or page by page just to go over how you complete this. Um, so a few things to note on the landing page. It says, do not use if you do not have a qualifying children. Well, clients with uh, children, without children can use this tool to claim any missing economic impact payments. So already there's a little bit of a misinformation. So even if you're working with clients without children, and they haven't received their full first or second stimulus payments, this may be their best option to get them. And then what clients need, basic information, including the full name, date of birth, social security numbers or items, and their current mailing address and email address. And they may have, and I don't think they did a good job separating this, but they may have bank account information to get direct deposit or an identity protection pin. Just apologies for the poor image quality as I'm looking at it. But next bit of, bit of warning, people do not trust the next page. They think it's an incorrect site. Uh, it looks like it was made in the early 2000s and they're now at freefillableforms.com and no longer on a .gov IRS website. This is the legitimate website uh, for it. And this honestly is where a lot of people get stuck and just think that they got to the wrong page. Help encourage them to keep all right, and so you've made it to creating an account. As we've already um, gone over, you'll need an e the client will need their own email address to do this, create a new user ID, a phone, which is not required, but it is especially helpful in confirming, um, using it as a text co confirmation link and resetting any passwords. The password has its own uh, requirements and just helping them make sure that they fulfill those uh, characters, uh, the character limits and the lowercase, uppercase, Using a number and special character can be really helpful. I find that just getting people onto the form is part of the biggest challenge. So just making sure we use that and then confirming the password. Moving into, uh, moving on to entering basic information. First thing to note is that there are normally five filing statuses and here you'll only see single or married filing jointly. If you have any clients who say, well, I'm really actually head of household, they're gonna file for, for single for this simplified form. So just making sure that they choose one or the other. The next is that the clients will need to enter their names exactly as they appear on their social security card or ITIN cards. Um, some, sometimes somebody may go as Bob and you're used to putting that on all the forms, but if their name is Robert on their social security card, that's the name you'll need to enter in order for it to be accepted. Also just wanna note that parents with ITINs um, could still qualify for the child tax credit if their dependents have social security numbers. So making sure not to turn somebody away just because they don't have a social security number. It's also important they enter a secure mailing address if one is available to them. Even if they plan on getting their checks directly deposited into an account, the IRS will use that mailing address to, um, in, for any future contact purposes. Uh, dependents are not eligible for the child tax credit or economic impact payment. So if they mark that they can be claimed as a dependent on somebody else's return, this will dequalify them for the credit. So they should not mark those boxes if they cannot be claimed as a dependent on anyone else's return. And then just double check that they don't have a filing requirement or plan on filing a completed return at a different time. 
All right. And then step one, or step one, it just keeps being step one, even though it's multiple. Uh, that's where you're going to be entering the dependent information. Same goes for the dependent's name, social security number, make sure it matches what's on the card. Uh, and then listing the relationship to you. An identity IP pin, identity protection pin is issued by the IRS to try to avoid identity protection. If they don't have this, it's something you can skip. The next big thing is determining if they can qualify for the child tax credit. Some just basic qualifiers are they must be under the age of 17 in 2020 or under the age 18 in 2021. We did the math for you. It's born on or after January 1st, 2004. And then they lived with you for over half the year. This next section is what I think is the most difficult part of this whole piece, and it's the recovery rebate credit. You're supposed to enter the total amounts missed for first and second economic impact payments and errors could delay the processing of the return. So we have a handout about calculating the recovery rebate credit um, on the Navigator handout. It's very detailed and in the weeds, but it is something that may really help somebody in making sure they get the correct um, payments and don't erroneously kind of put, this, put them into this hard processing piece with the IRS. Next is banking information. Uh, make sure to have the client triple check this information. Once it is submitted, it is very hard to get it updated. Yes, the CTC update portal is there, but they don't want to miss any of those payments because of um, an account number being entered incorrectly. And then again, at the end is the identity protection pin, which is only available um, or it is only there if it's actually applicable. If somebody has never received an IP pin, you can skip this all together. All right, and then personal verification. I've seen a lot of questions about this page and where do you find their self-selected signature pin? What I would recommend is trying to enter instead their 2019 adjusted gross income. So if they filed a full return for 2019, you will need the exact adjusted gross income from 2019, um, which can be found on line 8A on form 1040. But for those who are non, not filers traditionally and they um, either in 2019 filed a non-filer form in 2020, you know you'll just enter one dollar. It's kind of the way the IRS gets these forms submitted is just one dollar of AGI. Um, if they did not file at all, which is what probably the most common for people who need to use this form, they would enter zero and that counts as their verification. They don't need to use a PIN from last year. There is the option of using the last year self-selected PIN. I just find it pretty unusual if somebody doesn't, somebody filed last year knows their PIN, but doesn't know their AGI, but it is an option. And then the electronic signature, uh, you'll have to enter today's date, cell phone number, and this is where you create a self-selected PIN so that they can use next year. Um, and then the date of birth, I, they have information to enter a driver's license or state ID. This is usually only helpful when you're filing a state tax return. So I would go ahead and skip this since we're not filing a state tax return. And then making sure the email is verified. Um, if they haven't already done the, that, they need to do that um, before submitting the return. And then you're gonna continue to e-file. Once you click on that button, you'll verify that they aren't a robot. Click I agree, and that transmits their return. Once they've transmitted, clients should look for a notification if their return was accepted or rejected. It says on here that that might take 24 to 48 hours. I find it usually comes in in about half an hour, but don't be scared if it doesn't. They do have that, that window of 24 to 48 hours to get you that notification back. That email may go to spam and it's really important the clients know whether the return was accepted or rejected. So just warn them that that might be a little bit harder to find. And then what to do when a return rejects. So we find a high rate of rejected returns for non-filer returns. Um, we have a document that on the Navigator resource page of common rejects and what to do next. And we just encourage you to use that whenever working with your clients. Uh, so just a reminder about some of the resources that you can get go to on Get CTC to help you in that Navigator role. Um, I've already named a few of these documents, like calculating the recovery rebate cre credit, reasons to opt out, and then common rejects. And we just encourage you to also stay in touch with us um, and make sure to reach out to Get CTC if you have questions. Um, live chat is available with some of our customer service specialists that can help you as you're helping other people. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead 
and stop sharing my screen. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Courtney, thank you so much for all of that. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that we, we will be sending around the recording as well as the, the materials and resources that have been talked about during the, the webinar. So if you're frantically taking notes, uh, don't worry, you'll, you'll be able to, to rewatch it. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Emma, Zach, and, and the rest of our panelists to talk about removing barriers and innovative outreach strategies. Thanks, Alex. Um... I hope you all aren't tired yet. I know it's the afternoon and we're really excited to get into this engaging conversation. Um, but I just wanted to throw out a few things um, before we introduce, reintroduce Pavel, Darla and Kat. And that I think what is really interesting in hearing from Courtney um, is, is the trust, the fear and shame and the confusion and the frustration from families using the CTC non-filer tool. And I, I know I'm personally excited and I hope you all are excited to hear from our rock star panelists. Um, and I'm just so grateful for them to taking the time out of their busy day um, and their schedule to learn, um, to help us understand what they've done in their communities to help families sign up um, and give us some innovative strategies and lessons learned. Um, so I'm, I'm confident as well that coming out of this discussion, we will better understand how to serve families um, where they are in their communities. And I think in the chat, what was really clear to me is people are asking about community navigators. People are asking for funding on um, supporting families where they are holistically. Um, and so during this kind of moderated conversation, <clears throat> while I plan to ask, Zach and I plan to ask a few questions from the panelists, um, this is really meant to be for you. And so we want you to participate in this webinar and we want you to feel engaged and to share your insights with us. Um, so we encourage you to use the chat function for questions. If you want to ask a question, um, please, or if you would like to come off mute, just put stack in the chat and we will get to you as soon as we can. Um, and we will also bring Courtney back um, into the conversation for the last 15 minutes of this webinar um, and where we open it up again to everybody. Um, so without further ado, because you really didn't come to hear me speak, um, we will turn it over to Pablo, Kat, and Darla for some great questions. Um, so to kick off our conversation, um, we're going to start with Pablo and just talk a little bit about um, some of the things that his, his organization, CASA, has done. So Pablo, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your organization, CASA, and some of the successes and challenges that you've had in helping immigrant families sign up? for social benefits, including the child tax credit. Um, and maybe you could share with us a little bit about some of the awareness and accessibility issues that you've seen in your community. Thank you, Emma, for inviting us. Um, 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 it's a real pleasure for us. And Courtney, great presentation. Thank you so much for educating us on, on that very important issue. Uh, so CASA is, uh, is the largest mid-Atlantic uh, immigrant rights organization. We are present in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. We have uh, been in business for over 35 years now. Uh, among the many, we, we have a model that combines services and organizing on politics. And among the services that we offer, we, we offer free tax preparation. We target uh, the, the poor among the poorest, <laughs> the poorest among the poor, because the people that we serve makes an average of $18,000 a year. Uh, they have four kids, they still sell money to their home country to, to help others there, so they are very struggling families. And we do this with a multicultural and multilanguage uh, approach. We offer our tax services and navigation services, at least in English, Spanish and French, and we usually are able to recruit uh, volunteers in other, in other languages as well. Among the many uh, victories that we have had, this year Maryland has become the second state offering uh, ETC, e EITC uh, payments for filers with ITIN. That was a huge victory because uh, people, uh, immigrants, has been very, very hard beaten by the, by the pandemic. And this help has not only been a financial support, but also an emotional support. It's Marylanders saying them, uh, you are welcome in our communities. That's great. Thanks, Pablo. Um, so I think some, some people in the audience probably don't know that CASA hosted a free tax um, preparation day with the IRS uh, last month. 
Could you tell us a little bit about that tax day and if there's you know, state and local organizations on the call, particularly those in the chat who have talked about how excited they are to be able to use these resources in their own communities. What are some of the things that you learned from that free tax preparation day? Um, and what were some of the challenges that you've seen? Yeah, so it was very, very exciting, not only for us, but also for, uh, for the publics, right? So it was great for them to see that uh, IRS employees were here Friday, Saturday, uh, helping them in person directly to, to apply and to, uh, to file taxes, to get the CTC. So it was a great event. We also were able to attract a lot of media attention that help us to raise awareness about the CTC, especially in Spanish, Telemundo, Univision, but also NPR. So many, many media outlets came here. Uh, the controller of Maryland was also here. So uh, it was a huge deal for, the, for, for, for us and for the community. If you guys are able to participate, to partner with the IRS in your local states, in your local offices, I think that this is worthy to do these CTC awareness uh, events with them because they also bring a, a lot to the to the community. I think that the main lesson learned is that uh, that this work requires a lot of case management, right? So it's uh, each family is one case, one one situation that you have to listen to, you have to understand what what their what their uh, background is, where they are coming from. Uh, what they have done already, what they have not done. And to, since after listening to them, you are able to understand what is the best way to help them. If the non-filer, if filing taxes, well, what is the best option for them? And then, uh, as you said uh, before, is how important it is uh, to have a trusted organization uh, working with them because they have, uh, especially for immigrants who has been attacking the last, for the last four years from the pre previous administration that has been preventing them from getting the, the uh, at least the, the first economic stimulus payments. So people has in mind that they are not eligible and you have to do a lot of education for them to understand that yes, that if you have a kid who has a social security number, regardless if you are filing your taxes when, with an item, you are eligible for the CTC. So this, this is a, a, a great word to have about that. So Pablo, it sounds like you've also worked to build trust in your, in your communities when you're serving your immigrant families. Could you tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you and how you're communicating um, with the families you serve and how those who are on the call can also work to build trust and also um, you know, calm the fear and, dis and dispel some of the shame that um, you know, we've already heard on this call. I, I guess, uh, Emma, that the, something that we share all the organizations that are in this, uh, in this conference call today is that we are there for them all year round, right? So we, we have not pop up to help them with CTC. We are there helping them in so many ways, so they trust on us. So I, I totally agree with them in, in not trusting those who now appear from nowhere <laughs> and try to help them. Uh, I, I would recommend them not to trust on those people. But for all the organizations that all the time in the in the field, they will have that trust. That trust is there. So so I think that uh, they already have that. What you have to prove is that you know this, that you have the knowledge to help them, and that you are resourceful. Because many times you need to call the IRS, you need to call the taxpayer advoc advocate service. You have to make several calls until you find a way to help one particular family. So you also have to deliver uh, in the trust that they put on you. That's great. Thanks, Pablo. Um, I know we're going to hear from Kat in a little bit about some of those, those similar themes. I'm, at least that's what I'm hearing. Um, could you, I know a lot of people are on, on this call are interested in the non filer tool that Courtney just went through. Um, have your families that you've served use the tool? What, what's that been like? Um, or, and or has a, a lot of your families that you've served um, just filed their taxes? Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, so there are many, many people who has filed taxes, but because they have to file uh, by paper, 
either because they were victims or of identity theft or because uh, they are asking for a new item or renewing their item. Uh, they have they have sent the, the taxes, but the IRS says that we never receive it. So they are in kind of limbo because for them, they have filed taxes. For the IRS, they have not filed taxes. So they don't know if to use the non-filer uh, portal or not to use or what avenue they have to, to claim. So uh, that is that is a, a huge barrier for many community members not knowing when to use the, 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 the portal. Also, the portal is not in Spanish or any other language spoken other than English in the country. So it would be great. So after 100 years of the IRS doing the taxes, for the first time ever, they have the 1040 form in Spanish this year. So that was a huge improvement. Hopefully they will start extending that uh, multi-language approach to other languages and other forms soon. Uh, so um, so that, 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 is, uh, that are the main barriers. And also uh, uh, as Corny mentioned, it's not, uh, it's not a smartphone friendly, the application. And for many immigrants and for many low-income families, they don't have a computer and internet at home. They use their smartphone to go, on, to go online. So if you don't have a proper tool for the smartphones, you will be missing a huge number of low-income families. Thanks, Pablo. I wanna make sure we have a lot of time for dialogue between the three of you and when Courtney comes back and also with the audience. Um, Kat, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Um, could you tell us a little bit, I know we heard some introductions from Alex on what Family Promise does, and maybe you could tell um, our listeners how, what Family Promise does and how you all have served um, families right now to sign up for the child tax credit. Thanks. Uh, so Family Promise is a national organization that has more than 200 affiliates across the nation. Each affiliate operates independently as a community response to um, family housing instability and homelessness. And so it's a really neat structure in that we're all able to, to respond to our community need as the community sees fit versus um, you know, having a national oversight, but we still get the national reach and national best pra practices. We're a holistic organization in that we focus on housing and housing instability and homelessness, but we serve families holistically. So we're looking at full family dynamics, um, full family goals, and really working to, to increase positively positivity across family dynamic while increasing housing stability. Um, and we do that with shelter services, homeless prevention, rapid rehousing, transitional housing. And so it's um, a really comprehensive organization for families who are, who are needing some stability around housing. Um, and we have been utilizing um, the non-filer tool here in Colorado Springs um, since it became available. And so we started doing it prior to the child care tax credit non-filer tool to get the recapture of, of stimulus payments, um, specifically around families who um, historically or recently haven't had any earned income. Um, and we do that by engaging families and talking with them about this, this benefit. Um, you know, families don't walk through our doors when they're having good days. They walk through our doors on usually one of the worst days of their lives and say, you know, I can't provide for my children's basic needs. And so um, part of really working to engage families and talk with them about that holistic recovery as a family is around budgeting. And nobody likes people up in their money and their expenses. But when we're talking about income and the ability to increase income without disqualifying from services that you need by utilizing the child care tax credit, um, we're able to really use that as an opener around the financial conversations. And so um, we have the conversations about, you know, tell us tell us where your money was coming from last year. And if you didn't have money coming in, did you know that this is available to you? And we're able to start at that income piece of we can increase your income without disqualifying you from anything that you need. And then have that build the relationship to talk about the deeper financial issues and um, conversations around expenses that nobody really wants to have with us. Luca, the, thank you, Kat. Lucas asked a, a, from, I think from a United Way organization, asked a great question. Um, and this can be for everybody, actually. We're just having, you know, all of you all share your insights with us. What experience do your organizations have regarding best practices for outreach? Would you like to go first, Kat? 
Sure. Um, so best practices for outreach start with building your network. And so really being a member of the community, not just the community of service providers, but the community of faith-based congregations where a lot of vulnerable families reach out and need um, a touching point. Um, it also comes with just, you know, as you're walking through your community and you see families who, you know, um, are flying a sign or are in a park and look like they've been sleeping there, just, just having a conversation and making that eye contact and saying, I see you, is there anything that you need today? And that's really the most effective outreach that we have is just the dignity of saying, I see you, and is there anything that you need today? Papa? Sorry, sorry, broke a little bit here. What was the question? What are some of your best um, strategies for outreach? I, I think that, I'm sorry for that. I'm, I think that, um, we, we do at CASA multilingual outreach. So uh, talking to the community in their own language the, or the language that they prefer is, is the, the basic, very important topic. And then uh, I think that also a great strength that we have is that CASA has an organizing department that reach um, thousands of people every day. So uh, that thousands of people come to our sites. We have 11 uh, welcome centers uh, in, in the three states. So people come to us, we, we are able to share flyers and, uh, and other information. So I think that those are our main strengths. Darla? Yeah, just building off of what Kat and Pablo say, you know, from a, a young family or a family perspective, really reaching out to the systems and the services that the families are already accessing. I think Kat and Pablo have done a great job and Courtney have really uh, um, underlying the need for outreach to be from individuals that folks trust. So we know families you know, are accessing food ba banks or you know different feeding programs, or maybe they're staying in a hotel or a motel or um, their children are enrolled in Head Start. So there's already these systems that families are touching and um, trust, but the, the folks working there don't necessarily know this information. That's really what we're trying to do at the, the National Network for Youth to get this information out to folks who are actually directly interacting with families who qualify, but are you know, unlikely to file taxes regularly and already be able to automatically access the funds. That's great. And building off that, Darla, what have been, um, you know, I, I know that your organization um, has a national network for youth. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how the youth have used their voices in the child tax credit conversation, as well as what have been some of the innovative strategies that, that your partners have used on the ground? Yeah, absolutely. So, we're national, like Family Promise. We partner with over 300 youth serving organizations across the US, as well as young people who've experienced homelessness through our National Youth Advisory Council and youth advisory boards that we help communities start across the country. So, you know, I mean, similar to what folks have been saying, you know, our young people face a lot of barriers, right? They don't have a computer, they don't have a stable address. It's very challenging for young people to access um, or get a bank account and actually access funds because they lack a government ID and other vital documents. And it can be very difficult to access those vital documents because there's either fees, and if you're a minor, or even 18 and 19 in some instances, you need a parental signature that just isn't available. So I would say in general, what we've been hearing from young people and providers is that um, giving cash to disconnected and, you know, historically marginalized and under-resourced individuals through a tax process is not maybe the best way to get money and cash directly to the most marginalized and disconnected um, in our society. So I would say, you know, we've learned a lot and the, the non-filer tool that the IRS launched to help folks access the economic stimulus payments was definitely a step a step forward. Um, and I would definitely say there's lessons learned. And we have young people and providers who are really advocating for improvements, you know, similar to the, the recommendations that Pablo and, and Kat have recommended. I mean, a lot of our young people struggle to access any type of tax benefit because their parent is claiming them. 
and their parent is um, receiving the tax benefit, even though that young person was maybe kicked out for identifying as LGBTQ, or that young person ran away from a domestic violence or you know mentally ill or substance abusing parent, but that parent is still claiming them, you know, that young person and getting the tax benefit. So when a young person gets the support from a community-based organization to file the taxes to try to get the benefit that they legally have a right to, you know, young people are being denied. It's being rejected, I guess, in the IRS um, instance. And then a young person is put in a position where, oh, do I do I move forward and potentially get my parent in trouble? And no matter the fraught or the you know abuse or rejection, you know, typically a lot of young people are are hesitant to get a parent in trouble, right? Even if they do have a legal right to those funds. So some of the things our our young people um, are recommending is just to make that easier and cleaner for young people to actually claim a benefit that they have a legal right to. They don't wanna have to get their parent in trouble um, in order to get a tax benefit that they have a right to. Also, you know, how the IRS communicates, which is, you know, bank accounts, mailing addresses, you know, you need to have a desktop computer. None of those things work, um, you know, for young people, right? And so our young people needs to be mobile friendly. Um, do I have to have like a mailing address? Do you have to give money, you know, via either a debit card that's mailed or a paper check or a bank account? What about the cash app? I mean, our young people are very clear that, um, you know, it's, it would be much easier if they could get electronic payment from the IRS through the cash app, um, as opposed to going through all the hoops and trying to overcome all the barriers to open a bank account, which there are fees and paperwork and, you know, all the things. So those are some of um, the recommendations. And I think, you know, our hope from the National Network for Youth and Providers and Young People is that Treasury and the IRS is willing, you know, to, to change, to make sure um, these portals are in multiple languages and to provide, you know, more flexible options, especially for the most marginalized and disconnected in our community. And Emma, if, if I may add something else is that how important is to send a direct message? Because yes, uh, there are a lot of tax law behind all these decisions. So if you start uh, to avoid mistakes, you start using qualified dependent, this and that, and if you, and if you, and if you. So if you try to cover all the what if in the message, you will lose the people. So mm -hmm. I think it's very, very important to send a very direct message. And then probably if someone doesn't qualify, millions will qualify. If someone doesn't qualify, just ask, I'm sorry, we, 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 we made a mistake with you. Probably you, you didn't get the right message. But, but if you try to send the, all the legal message in your communication, you will lose the people. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I know we're gonna go through some of the questions in the chat in a moment. And again, encouraging anybody who'd like to come up need and ask a question, please put stack in the chat. Um, but a question to kind of center us a little bit for all three of you, since you all really do work directly with families, can you give us an example of a family that you've worked with, um, the barriers they've faced in accessing the child tax credit this year, and then what's kind of been necessary from your perspective to help them overcome these barriers? I can share two very briefly. One was a mother of four four kids in elementary school age and, and younger. She was uh, evicted from her home and she owns a tax refund of $1,300 she, she has not received yet. And uh, she's not receiving the CTC payments neither because she, she filed with an IT. So she's waiting for, for that refund and for that CTC. And she desperately needs the money to provide housing for the four kids because they are temporarily in a, in, in a room that someone else uh, allows them to use. So that, that is one family who desperately needs the, ma the money and is waiting for the IRS to process her, her, IT, uh, her, IT, uh, her tax return with, with an IT. And another family was, uh, she filed with the social security number um, but for, for she was a victim of identity theft and uh, she had to file by paper and the IRS claims that they never received the, the tax return. 
So she now is are in a limbo because she cannot she does she cannot use the 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 portal for non-filers because she did file, and the IRS says that she doesn't file. So we are helping her to, through the tax advocate services, but is is kind of a very difficult situation to resolve. So for us, um, one that comes to mind that we honestly spent the last uh, month working through was um, a mom with two kiddos and um, has never had earned income due to disability and didn't realize that she was eligible um, prior to coming into our shelter services for any kind of stimulus or any kind of tax credit and has been missing out on, on these opportunities. Um, and it started with um, the non-linearness of family homelessness. And so families bounce around a lot and sometimes they're in shelters, sometimes they're in places for not meant for habitation and then couch surfing. And so there was a number of addresses and trying to go through and verify identity and making sure that we had all of the paperwork that we needed. Um, social security number for a kiddo had been lost along the transitions. And so we had to start by um, filing for a new social security card because there had never been um, a tax return filed for with this kiddo on it. Normally we would try and get tax transcripts to verify social security numbers and move a process along faster. And so um, we ended up starting from a place of document readiness. And so what documents do we need to push this through? And what documents are we going to need for that holistic picture as well? And so it was going through and, and hitting the pavement with social security to get social security cards and then going to um, the DOR to make sure that we could get IDs and things like that. And then setting that expectation up front that this is going to be a process. This isn't going to be we're going to sit down with a laptop today and we're going to fill out this form and then everything's going to be hunky dory and being really candid about the fact that this is important for your family stability and all of these pieces go into it but it's not just for this tax credit where you're just going to say eh, I don't really need it that bad let's move on to something else it's that it all builds into the pyramid of your overall goals um, and so once we were able to get documents in hand then we used um, the non-filer tool which um, we got some interesting errors on and had to make some phone calls and go, I don't understand what, why this is, why this is kicking back to us. Um, and we went, I think we went through two or three rejections before we finally got it accepted. And so, um, you know, I think that it's just really important to be candid in that relationship piece when we're working with families that um, it, it, you know, we hope for it to be a seamless process, but realistically, we want to feed all these other pieces into it that are going to help you meet your goals. And just what we've been hearing from our network of providers and from young people themselves, you know, the biggest barriers are knowing your social security number, <laughs> knowing what you're eligible for. Uh, you know, we've heard from some folks that, you know, in case managers are, you know, doing home visits, the families didn't actually believe that they could be getting this money. It sounds kind of a little bit too good to be true, which I think underscores the need for trusted people to really be interfacing with families. And then, you know, access to a bank account or, a, you know, a, a stable address if you're getting a paper check or direct deposit. And then, I mean, the other thing we've been hearing is a lot of, you know, a lot of rejections and then what to do, you know, and like, okay, so they, they submitted, you know, through the non-filer and they got, you know, it was rejected and not really knowing how to, you know, how to fix it or where to go for resources. Um, so that's why, I mean, the information prevented on this webinar and just being able to point our providers in the direction of additional advice and, you know, case managers and our providers knowing you don't need to be a tax expert, right? There are resources to help you help, help the families that you're working with to be able to get this, this money. Thanks, Darla. Um, this is a great time, again, to open it up. Um, I saw some questions in the chat that maybe haven't been answered. Um, Lucas, we should, I would love to have you come off, off mute and also ask this question um, verbally, but- um, I, I, could, I could, sorry, yeah, I, could, I, def I definitely could if, if, if you'd like. No, please. Um, sure, so, uh, so I really appreciate everyone's input so far related to, to outreach and, and what everyone's organizations ha have done. I'm, I'm definitely taking a, a bunch of notes here of, of what we can do better. 
uh, whether it's, you know, we already have connections with our you know, local government and, and local, you know, community organizations, but uh, definitely we can build on those and, and make sure that they're informed about these things because I know they are definitely not on top of the, you know, child tax credit portal and, and, and all these things. Um, the, the other thing I just posted in the chat was related to, uh, you know, I, I saw an organization that they knocked on doors of an affordable housing complex to, uh, you know, try and inform people about the child tax credit. And, and I think that's a good idea. I, you know, I don't know if anyone else has had tried that in their communities. Um, you know, that, that's something we're, you know, considering, you know, trying in our community. Uh, it, it's definitely just difficult, you know, as a United Way, a, a lot of, uh, you know, people know of us and, and they come to us, but really the issue is all the people that are not coming to us that, that really need the help. For me, if you, you know, when you're talking outreach and networking, um, I would be hard pressed to talk about my taxes with somebody who knocked on my door. Um, and so that, that doesn't, sit well with me, but when I think about how can we reach the most vulnerable families and where are their trusted relationships, I think about CPCD and I think about Head Start and I think about the schools and really getting into the school networks where there are those trusted relationships. Parents are trusting their kiddos with those, with their kid, you know, their kiddos with these people every day and just making sure that we've done the outreach to the referral source so that a trusted referral is getting a warm handoff to us with families who may not be reaching out to us for housing services, but are reaching out in their school community for, you know, other needs. Dola or Pablo? Was that sufficient? <laughs> that was a great answer. Awesome. I agree with Kat. I think it does go back to relationships. I mean, we've heard from some of our young people, you know, in a school context that they wish they're instead of these posters like climb the next mountain and dream, they wish there was the poster with like, if you need a place to live, go to here tonight. And so uh, I don't know if that, you know, applies like posters and flyers. Um, but I know that that's something our young people um, have said to us in terms of just outreach strategies for resources generally. I agree with the schools, public libraries are two uh, good places where to do outreach and we use a lot of that because many family immigrants and low-income families go there for for books every day or for storytelling etc. So th those are uh, very good avenues to uh, to explore too. Awesome. Um, there's a question from Stephanie Fields from around about 2.30. Stephanie, are you still on and you'd like to ask her question? Yeah, I'm still on. Um, so I work at a university and I work specifically with a federal grant with the U.S. Department of Education called C Campus. So that, that grant specifically works with parenting students who cannot afford child care. And so those funds go directly to pay child care tuition. And so with these tax credit, I'm so happy that we have this um, platform right now so that I can be able to educate my students. But one of the questions that um, how, you know, to be eligible for this grant, students have to be Pell Grant uh, recipients. And so with this tax credit, I don't know, this might be an obvious question, but with the tax credit, you know, a lot of us who are working under this grant were concerned, like how is that gonna impact their eligibility for estimated family income and then you know, Pell Grant for the future, the upcoming, the next year, once these all these tax credits are applied. And anyone can answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, um... That's a great question that like, I, honestly, I might need to do a bit more digging and just making sure I'm answering this correctly. But generally speaking, tax credits like the child tax credit, like the earned income credit, like the stimulus payments are not included in taxable income. So while they're claimed on a tax return, they're not included in calculating somebody's household income for the year. Um, so it shouldn't do it in that regard. I think one of the things just to be cautious of, I know we've worked really closely with um, some 
some groups here on completing the FAFSA and doing that is making sure that those folks are filing correctly for all of the benefits. So we see a lot of kids who, um, or not kids, but 18 year olds or 19 year olds who are filing their own tax return. Um, and that that messes up some of the, the back end things and they're, they're doing it to make sure that they're getting access to the um, economic impact payments and all of those things. And so just making sure it's consistent. Um, so if a family is, um, if a child is independent from their parents and are doing all those things on their own, making sure that's consistent with how they're filing um, for everything um, is gonna be a major player in that. The other piece is also that we've noticed, or I know we had a um, out in Colorado with um, the Denver Scholarship Foundation, something that they brought to our attention was a lot of parents um, incorrectly filing as head of household when they were married, just all those things to kind of be, be aware of that there are kind of bigger complications with making sure that the FAFSA matches what's on a tax return and how somebody is filing. Don't know if that completely answered your question, but I'm gonna take it back to our team and just make sure that I'm not misrepresenting that information. That was helpful, thank you. Awesome, and, and Courtney, um, another question was asked to you a little bit earlier while you were doing the webinar by um, Brandon Gray. Is Brandon still on? Yes, I am. I can ask your question, Brandon, if you're if you're still on, if you prefer. And then we'll go into detail and Okay, I'll ask it and just answer um, this for you, Courtney. I, um, Brandon asked a question. I see that they only asked for the first and last name. Um, this is when you were doing the, um, you were filling out the CTC non-filer sign-up tool. What if someone has a middle name of their SSC? Great question. So there is a place for a middle initial on the non-filer form. One thing to note, and I was sort of rushing through this, but something to note is how many times a return comes back rejected because the social security number, ITIN number, does not match the name that's on that that's um, on that card or letter, and a lot of that is just this equation that the IRS uses of the first four um, letters of the last name need to match that, and the first name need to match that database. So I know we work with families who have to um, have what are considered two last names, have middle name, all those things. And it's just important to make sure that whatever is their first of their last name um, or the first name of their last name is included in that and not lumped into the middle initial. I feel like that's a really confusing way of describing that, but just making sure to be as accurate as possible based on how the Social Security Administration or ITIN describes their name, if that helps. But you can also, yes. middle name won't reject a return if it's missing, just for your okay. information. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Nancy, uh, Edney asked a question uh, earlier as well about, um, Pablo, this is probably for you, about immigrants. Um, so immigrants cannot file, but if they have U.S. citizen children, they can file themselves. I don't know if Nancy Salon would like to come off mute. Yeah. There, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, so the mom's an immigrant. She has three children that are U.S. citizens. Um, does she have them file or does she do it for them? Or she's very worried about putting any information on a form since she's an immigrant, okay. an undocumented immigrant. Nancy, thank you so much for your question because it's very important that the info that that is also something that we uh, we communicate all the time to immigrants is that the information that the IRS has will never ever be shared with any other agency. So they have to know that uh, the information that they put in the in the tax return, nobody will have access. No, no ICE, no immigration, no, nobody, no other organization will have access to that. So they should, they should trust uh, that the information is safe and they will not have any kind of uh, repercussion for, for, for filing taxes. Uh, and yes, that, that, uh, that mother 
uh, will receive the CTC payments for the for the three kids who are U.S. citizens, right? So she should, if she doesn't have, if she has not yet filed taxes, uh, probably it's better for her to ask uh, to petition for a or to apply for a, for an ITIN. Uh, the ITIN will also help her uh, when we get immigration reform. Uh, having an ITIN and a history of paying taxes in the U.S. will also help her to with, with, during the during the uh, adjustment of the immigration status. So I would recommend the mother that uh, to to ask for an IT for herself and then file the taxes, including the three children, and she should receive the payment. To, to, I'm sorry to ask for what herself for uh, for an IT. An IT is when when you when you are not eligible for a social security number and you have income in the U.S. The, the way to pay taxes is asking uh, the IRS to issue uh, an, uh, an individual uh, individual tax identification number, ITIN. Okay. And, uh, so if you, if you go to any VITA site or if you Google the form W7, you will find all the instructions there. Okay. Uh, and I will happy if you if you send me an email, I will happy to continue to continue this conversation offline. Oh, great! Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Only a few minutes left. Um, I wanted to make sure that I, I know Sarah Camp, is she still on? She, I was trying to chat with her about this custody question and um, it's very hard to chat and also monitor the chat um, and talk. So three things at once is impossible. Sarah, are you still on and would you like to ask uh, your question on custody? Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I work with um, relative caregivers, and so it might be that children within this, the year of 2021, have recently come into their custody, so they have new dependents. And my understanding is there's no way for them to update that portal on new dependents and start receiving those payments just yet, but I wanted to make sure that that was correct. Anyone can answer it, or, or um, if none of the panelists feel like they can, then Elisa or I can answer it too. There's currently not a way to update dependents, but I believe that there's an update coming um, hopefully next month to the tool that will allow us to be able to update address and dependents, which will be super beneficial. And that's called the CTC update portal. <laughs> Some people call it CTC up. <laughs> um, and there is um, what we can do after this call to Sarah and brothers who are asking, we'll share those type of resources um, and links and the like in addition um, to this webinar slide. And the IRS actually on its FAQ page, I believe or on the, on the CTC update portal site has a list of things that are coming as they're continuing to update the portal um, and they're continuing to update um, just the website frequently. So it has a list of when we should get information on stuff like that, like adding a, a new dependent. Um, we're basically at time, but I want to make sure um, folks have had enough time to ask questions. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask another question? Um, I keep saying it, don't be shy. <laughs> So one of our young leaders did ask a question in the chat, EJ. Uh, I think Thanks about inmates. Sure. sure. Um, if if there's a how inmates, um, I'm assuming incarcerated persons can access the child tax credit and what ID they would use. I don't know the answer to the question. So <laughs> it'd be great if any of you all did, or we could follow up with EJ afterwards. One, one little bit of advice is um, that the IRS on filer portal doesn't require you to enter um, ID information. So if they're able to use like, if they're able to use a computer while in the facility and go ahead and fill that out, obviously there's a lot of other complications to using the tool, but that's kind of one area where you wouldn't need to actually enter in 
you know, a current driver's license or ID. That might, might be helpful. I know there are some amazing Vita groups and other partners who are doing um, work within, uh, within these facilities to try to help make sure everybody is getting their stimulus payments and the child tax credit if they're eligible. Um, so it's just something that um, looking out for some of those groups in your community. I don't have a full list of that, but I'm happy to connect if that's something other people are in need of. That's great. And any last minute advice from our fantastic uh, panelists, Courtney, Darla, Pablo, and Kat, any, any final words that you'd like to share, words of wisdom and encouragement um, for our attendees? So many of them really deeply caring about serving their clients better and serving their communities. I, if I may, I, I would like to say that this is a very good uh, path toward economic justice. So we, we need to encourage people to uh, find a way to, to apply and to get the CTC payments. This is this money that they really need and is uh, even though it may be difficult to get it, and even though they may be late to receive the monthly payments, uh, they need to do it because they, if, they don't, if they don't get the money in the next tax season, they may lose it forever. So, so even if they, they, they should start working right now, to fulfill all the steps toward getting the, the money either now or later during tax season. I think it's just really exciting to see how many people join the call and are excited to be doing outreach and engaging families in, in these needed services. Um, for me, you know, I would just always recommend that we come from a place of um, relationship and be really trauma informed in how we're reaching out to families and things like that. And remember that, um, you know, right now there are so many households who are behind on rent and things like that. And so flyers on doors, pretty triggering for families right now. Um, and just really taking that viewpoint of, you know, how can I build a relationship with vulnerable families, knowing that this is one really needed opportunity for families, but you have an opportunity here to engage them in other services and build a relationship to, to, provide holistic opportunities and referrals to with this. I echo everything Pablo and Kat say, and all I would just add is just a huge thank you for everyone who's doing this outreach and to just really stick with folks through everything. Don't look at it as, you know, a one-time sit down, you know, with a parent and help them fill out a form and then you'll never see them again and everything will be resolved. But to really take you know, like Ken and Pablo were saying, a much more holistic approach and recognize that they probably also have other needs um, as well, you know, kind of beyond just filling out a non-filer tool or, you know, using the update portal or any of those things. And just one, you know, everybody is so well informed um, on our panel of kind of some of these real barriers and reason or the challenges to this work. I think Something I just like to reiterate is just that many of these families probably have tried um, in some some respect, and some of these tools just aren't working for their circumstances and are not necessarily designed for them in mind. And I think we all need to do all of our effort of trying to do as much as we can in real time to help them uh, meet their needs right now, but then also thinking through how do we create a more equitable system that allows people to access these tools on their own and be independent in some of this work. Um, and I'm just so grateful for organizations um, like all of yours that are doing this on the ground work. So just excited to see this and more people come under this tax tent of people who are interested in this work and yeah, good work, good work to come. And with that, I think we're gonna close our show. Thanks again to Courtney and Darla and Pablo and Kat, you were all great. And thanks for everybody who showed up and, and paid attention and asked questions. I thought this went Really great. I think Elise is putting up a screen that has our contact information on it. Um, so if you have any further questions or need any resources or anything like that, you can get in touch with any of the four of us at the ABC Coalition uh, or any of our, our panelists. We will send um, this slide deck around with, with this contact information as well as a recording of the, of the show today. So. Um, you can learn more about our coalition on that page and thank you and everybody have a great day.